Hello everyone, welcome back to English 1B, Critical Thinking and Writing. In this video, while we're still discussing themes, I wanted to talk about a couple of things, but mostly I wanted to talk about my dinner with Calais. First off, you're eventually going to have to write an essay where you analyze one of the short stories we've read so far. But I have to tell you up front that you can't do it for the five orange pips, and you can't do it for my dinner with Calais. Those two projects are off the table because of how much work we've already put into them. We've already broken down characters, setting, plot for the five orange pips, and we will be returning to it again when we talk about language use and symbolism. And I've already given you a video analysis of the five orange pips that makes use of the historical and cultural contextual elements surrounding that work, as well as an analysis from another reviewer's perspective. Five orange pips, aka the time that Sherlock Holmes went to war with the Ku Klux Klan and nothing happened because they all died before he could do anything. Of course, you don't have to start absolutely from scratch for that essay. You know, we've talked about every short story we've read so far, and we've gone a little deeper into the storm and the story of an hour and you are allowed to use any one of those. However, starting an analysis of the five orange pips is starting the project with one half to three quarters of the work already done. Now, the reason you can't use my dinner with Calais is because the message of that story is really straightforward. I'm gonna talk about possible hidden meanings in a minute, but it is intended as a straightforward persuasive essay. If you look at the bottom of those pages, you can see that it was published in a journal called Pedagogy. Pedagogy is a word, the definition of which encompasses both the methods and the philosophy of a teacher's teaching. In other words, it is not just the way that material is presented or the way that learning is assessed, but also one's understanding of why we do things the way that we do them. The whole point of that story is that Anson was trying to convince other teachers to adopt these dialogue assignments, and it is written in the form of a dialogue in order to serve as a demonstration of the argument he was making. He was basically walking the walk while talking the talk. I use this as a reading assignment because I want students to do a dialogue assignment, and it explains what they are and why they are useful. However, I hadn't thought about doing a further literary analysis on that story until a student asked me about it one day. And when I thought about it, one question came to mind when considering the elements of the plot. Why does it end like a ghost story? Why wouldn't it end when the dinner ends? Why include a little epilogue about how there's no evidence of Calais' existence? Okay, I guess that's three questions. But the other two just serve to clarify the first? Some students struggle with this story, or they miss the straightforward message because they get lost in searching for a meaning behind Calais' disappearance. So why write it like that? When I thought about the characters, no new questions and no new meanings arose. I mean, you have one character that knows about dialogue assignments, working to convince the main character to try them. And you have a main character whose journey is to start out curious about dialogue assignments. He has a conversation wherein he throws up several questions and objections, but then ultimately he's convinced to try using dialogue assignments in his classroom. All of this supports the main, obvious message of the story. Dialogues and dialogue assignments are good learning tools. The only question I came up with is, why is Calais made into a mysterious, mystical character? Which is really just the same question as, why does it end like a ghost story? Do you see where I'm going with this? I'm walking through the steps of analysis that we've already gone over. When I consider the setting, the story takes place in and around a university campus. You get two locations, but a lot of it goes unspecified. We don't know what state or city this takes place in, and that probably serves the obvious message. As I said in my video about setting, when setting is unspecified, readers are free to fill in their own details, and it makes the story more relatable to a wider group of people. 
Anson wants teachers in Berkeley to picture it taking place in and around Berkeley, and teachers at the University of Massachusetts to picture it taking place in and around the UMass campus, and even teachers at California State University of San Bernardino to picture it taking place in and around CSUSB. The time of day doesn't seem to be particularly important, but many academics have had the experience of going out to dinner with a colleague to discuss their discipline or their teaching methods. I don't think things would have changed much if they had met for lunch, but meeting for dinner means it's either dark out when they start or it's dark out by the time they finish. And that serves the spooky atmosphere, which then lends weight to the ghost story aspect. But consider the two locations that are specified. They start at a bar named Devil's, and they end at a restaurant named Croyez. And that led me to thinking about symbolism, which we haven't discussed yet. But I think Devil's is a pretty obvious symbol. Now, it could be that this story takes place in New Jersey, where the Devil's baseball team makes their home. And that would mean that the story takes place in and around Princeton. But then where does that line of thought lead you? All you have left is the surface level message. Dialogues and dialogue assignments are useful methods for teaching and learning. But if Devils is meant to conjure up the devil in your mind, that also seems to speak to the spooky tone of the story. And it gives more significance to the ending where Calais seems to drop out of existence. So then what about the other location? Croyez, or more appropriately pronounced croyez, is the French word for belief. It's also sometimes translated to faith, and it is related to the word for cross. Le croix is the cross. But you know what else is related to the word for cross? Le croissant. Uh, what I was trying to get at in that last scene was that uh, sometimes symbols have more than one meaning associated with them, and sometimes those multiple meanings all play a part in interpreting the story. But sometimes some of those other meanings can just be irrelevant, tangential meanings. Now, as I get into the possibilities of what these symbols mean in relation to each other and the overall theme, it's important to note that none of this contradicts the obvious message. The message is still dialogues and dialogue assignments are useful teaching methods. And it is important to note that authors are in control of every aspect of their stories, but they're not always conscious of the meanings that they're sending. Sometimes you can get one message when you examine the elements of plot, and then a contradicting message when you examine the characters and the setting. That usually doesn't make for a good story, but it can sometimes make for a great one. Like, on one hand, the author could just have a confusing message. But sometimes, you know, the point of the story is to get you thinking about an issue, raise a question, uh, examine a few possible answers, and then not declare that one is the best answer. However, that's not what's happening here. So if we start with some sort of association with the devil, and we end with a similar association with Jesus, it could represent the character transitioning from darkness, evil, and ignorance to wisdom, light, and goodness. By the way, humans have been associating knowledge and wisdom with light for thousands of years. That's why we call it enlightenment. It's also why illuminate means to literally turn on a light, but it also means to explain demonstrate or clarify something. This, I think, very obviously just reinforces that obvious message. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Every work of literature doesn't need to be a deliberately obscure puzzle that you have to decipher in order to get any meaning out of it. It is okay when a story has an obvious message, and then when you dig deeper, the symbolism just reinforces that obvious message. But if you ignore the Jesus association and just take it as going from devil to belief, then you have something more related to a Faustian bargain. Now, Dr. Faustus was a character who sold his soul to the devil in order to gain skill in his profession as well as wealth and fame. I don't remember the details of the original story, but immortality may also have been involved. But in the end, everything fell to ruin 
the devil took his soul to hell. The old deal with the devil is another ancient literary trope, but it pretty rarely comes in the form of an actual contract made with an actual supernatural creature. When a character has to compromise their morals to get something they want, that's a form of giving up their soul. Sometimes, it's an independent musician agreeing to work with a major record label and changing their lyrics to suit advertisers. Sometimes it's an actress agreeing to do a nude scene. Sometimes it is a conversation with an actual supernatural creature. This Faustian bargain thing here is an interpretation that I like. And you should remember it because it will come up again later in this course. But that doesn't mean that it is the correct interpretation. See, if the Faustian bargain was a serious and important element of the story, we could find evidence for it elsewhere. And I really can't. Dr. Faustus fell to ruin and went to hell. And remember, this can be interpreted metaphorically, so it could be anything from dying or going to jail to a character's friends turning on them or simply them feeling miserable for what they've done. The narrator didn't go to hell or even express any regret over employing Calais' methods. Dr. Faustus signed a contract, but this could metaphorically be any form of quid pro quo agreement. Quid pro quo is a this or that type of exchange, whether it's spoken out loud or talked around and implied. There's nothing like a contract mentioned, and there's no quid pro quo happening here. Motivated by greed, lust, and avarice, Dr. Faustus wanted greater skill, fame, and fortune. Anson's main character wanted to be a better teacher to help his students come to a better understanding of his material. Dr. Faustus literally sold his soul, which could be a metaphor for compromising one's principles. The narrator didn't compromise his principles. He was curious about a thing, and then he learned about it. In the process, he became convinced to start using it. Dr. Faustus had a conversation with a powerful, supernatural creature, which could be a metaphor for just a very powerful person. Eh, okay. He seemed to be supernatural, but Calais didn't seem to wield a lot of power. Interpreting things closer to literally, Calais disappearing at the end could more easily be explained by him being an angel than a devil. But of course, one of the things about the devil is that he may disguise himself as an agent of salvation. So, eh, eh, but even a ghost is just as likely as a devil. But with the Jesus association, the angel interpretation seems much more appropriate. So, if there is an intentional allusion to the Faustian bargain in this story, the only thing that lends a tiny bit of support to it is that the tone is kind of spooky. But if it was put there intentionally, I think it's Anson playfully acknowledging that adopting this drastically different kind of assignment might feel like a Faustian bargain for teachers. Remember that this story was published in the journal Pedagogy and thus intended as a persuasive essay for teachers. A lot of teachers are going to dismiss this idea right out of hand because it just feels wrong. Because it's a very different way of doing things. Anybody who tries to use this in the classroom is likely going to feel weird about it. Not me, though, because I was introduced to this whole thing when I was still studying to become a teacher. And I've been using it since I first started teaching English 1B. However, it would still feel off to me to push it to the extremes talked about in the story. For example, I never use this assignment in English 1A. By the way, we teachers don't just pile on assignments whenever we learn of a new one. We have to take something out in order to make space for new assignments. Taking out something that you know works to bring in something that you're unsure about 
is a bit nerve-wracking. So, if most people think it feels wrong to teach like this, Anson is acknowledging that it might seem like a deal with the devil. But he's also claiming that it's really not. So, what's the theme of my dinner with Calais? Dialogues and dialogue assignments are useful teaching tools. What's the point of the mysterious ending? Probably to make it a more entertaining story and to acknowledge the discomfort teachers might feel in employing such methods in the classroom for the first time. Is there a Faustian bargain involved? Only in like a playful way to acknowledge the discomfort teachers might feel bringing this drastically different teaching method into their classroom. And when you're asked to write an essay analyzing a short story for the class, what are the two stories you aren't allowed to choose? My Dinner with Calais and The Five Orange Pips. That's all I have for today. Uh, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time.